السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد أما بعد So on this night the 16th of Sha'ban of the year 1441 after the Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam coinciding with the Gregorian calendar of being Thursday the 9th of April we commence and carry on with our explanation and our ta'liq upon the text Kitab al-Siyam the chapter of fasting from Bulugh al-Maram authored by al-Hafidh Ahmed ibn Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimahullahu ta'ala who died in the year 852 after the Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in, in this session today insha'Allah we're going to take three ahadith Hadith number 29, Hadith number 30, and Hadith number 31. قال رحمه الله تعالى وعن عائشة رضي الله عنها أنها قالت كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يصوم حتى نقول لا يفطر ويفطر حتى نقول لا يصوم وما رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم استكمل صيام شهر قط إلا رمضان وما رأيته في شهر أكثر منه صياما في شعبان متفق عليه واللفظ لمسلم عائشة من الله سبحانه وتعالى be pleased with her narrated that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم used to fast until one would say he won't break his fast and he would abandon fastening at other times until one would say he shall never fast and I never saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fast for a complete month except for the month of Ramadan. And I never saw him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fast a month more than he did in the month of Sha'ban. This hadith was recorded by the two shaykhain or the two shaykhs, al-Bukhari and Muslim. And that is why al-Hafid said agreed upon. And the wording, yani the wording of this hadith is from Muslim. Aisha radiallahu anha in this hadith says, وَكَانَ يَصُومُ حَتَّى نَقُولَ لَا يُفْطِرُ He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fast up until one would say he won't break his fast. What does this mean? What this means is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would consecutively fast. He'd fast day after day after day. He would string a number of days one after the other in fasting. And then she said رضي الله عنها وَيُفْطِرُ حَتَّى نَقُولَ لَا يَصُومُ he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wouldn't or he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would break his fast at other times up until one would say that he shall never fast and that similarly means he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would consecutively not fast a number of days one after the other and so we extrapolate a number of benefits from this hadith the first is that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to vary between the different types and forms of worship according to the greater benefit. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to vary between the different types and forms of worship according to the greater benefit. And what this means is, is, is that if he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was preoccupied with dealing with the affairs of the Muslims, then he sallallahu alayhi wa would break his fast such that he gain strength in attending to the needs of the Muslims. That's what that means. And so when we say that he sallallahu alayhi wa used to vary between the different types of and forms of worship according to the greater benefit, what we mean is, is that he sallallahu alayhi wa if he was preoccupied with dealing with the affairs of the Muslims, then he would break his fast such that he gained strength in attending to the need of the Muslims. The second benefit extrapolate from this hadith is that it is not legislated to fast an entire month in totality. 
except for the month of Ramadan. It is not legislated to fast an entire month in totality except for the month of Ramadan. This was taken from the statement of Aisha radiallahu anha whereby she said, وَمَا رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ اسْتَكْمَلَ صِيَامَ شَهْرٍ قَطْ إِلَّا رَمَضَانٍ And I never saw the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم fast for a complete an entire month except for the month of Ramadan. And that is why we say that the second point extrapolated from the hadith is that it is not legislated to fast an entire month in totality except for the month of Ramadan. The third benefit we extrapolate from this hadith is the legislating of increasing in the days a person fasts in the month of Sha'ban. And this happens to be the month of Sha'ban. The legislating of increasing in the days a person fasts in the month of Sha'ban. This was taken from the statement of Aisha radiallahu anha whereby she said, وَمَا رَأَيْتُهُ فِي شَهْرٍ أَكْثَرَ مِنْهُ صِيَامًا فِي شَعْبَانٍ and I never saw the Messenger of Allah وسلم, fast a month more than he did in the month of Sha'ban. And from the wisdoms that the scholars mention in, 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 in mentioning the reason why the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would fast Sha'ban a lot is that it is a month that the people are heedless of. Sha'ban is a month that the people are heedless of. As it occurred in the hadith of Usama ibn Zayd radiyallahu anhuma, whereby he said, Ya Rasulullah, Lam araka tasumu shahran min al-shuhur ma tasumu min sha'ban. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Thaaka shahrun yaghfalu anhu al-nas bayna al-rajaba wa ramadhan. Usama ibn Zayd radiyallahu anhuma, he said, O Messenger of Allah, I haven't seen you fast a month the way you fast in the month of Sha'ban. And then messenger, and so the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that is a month in which the people are heedless of. It falls between Rajab and Ramadan. And the way in people are heedless of Sha'ban is because the month prior to Sha'ban, the month that precedes Sha'ban is Rajab. And Rajab is the seventh month in the Islamic calendar. Rajab is a sacred month. So people look out for Rajab. Sacred month. And with regards to the sacred months, then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa informed us of the sacred months. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thalathun sard wa wahidun fard. There are three which are consecutive and one which is single. The three consecutive are Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah and Muharram. Dhul Qa'da, the 11th month, Dhul Hijjah, the 12th month, and Muharram. They are the three sacred months that are consecutive. Thalath and Sard, three are consecutive. Wahid and Fard, that single month which is sacred, is, Muh- is uh, Rajab. Is Rajab. And so people, they do look out for the month of Rajab. And the month after Sha'ban is the month of Ramadan the ninth month of this Hijri calendar, the Islamic calendar. And similarly, likewise, people, they do look out for Ramadan. And so Sha'ban, people are heedless of that month. And that is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ذَاكَ شَهْرٌ يَغْفَلُ عَنْهُ النَّاسِ Second wisdom in why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would fast the month of Sha'ban is that it was an exercising of the soul and preparing of the soul towards the fasting of the month of Ramadan. That fasting and increasing in fasting the month of Sha'ban is an exercise for the soul and a preparing of the soul towards the fasting of the month of Ramadan. A third wisdom mentioned as to why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would increase in fasting in the month of Sha'ban is that it is an encouragement in acquainting and familiarizing the soul with the form of worship that it finds easiest. And so the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he used to fast a lot because fasting was that which 
the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during that time, they used to find the easiest. And similarly, what we benefit from that is that you, O oh Muslim, you look to yourself. And you look, at, you look to that worship that you find easiest. Do you find Qira'at al-Qur'an easiest, the recitation of the Qur'an easiest? Do you find fasting easiest? Do you find Salat easiest? Do you find seeking knowledge easiest? Look to your soul and whichever form of worship you find easiest, then familiarize your soul with that form of worship so that you may accumulate a lot of reward. We move on to hadith number 30. قال رحمه الله تعالى وعن أبي ذر رضي الله عنه أنه قال أمرنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن نصوم من الشهر ثلاثة أيام ثلاث عشرة وأربع عشرة وخمس عشرة رواه النسائي والترمذي وصححه ابن حبان أبو ذر رضي الله سبحانه وتعالى be pleased with him narrated that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم commanded us to fast for three days of every month. The 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. And that is of the lunar months. This hadith was recorded by an nasai and a tirmidhi and ruled as authentic by Ibn Hibban. In this hadith, Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, Jundub ibn Junadat ibn Sufyan ibn Ubaidin al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu The companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He said Amarana Amarana And This Is By way Of Recommendation So this form of command descends from the level of application uh, to the level of recommendation and that's why it is referred to as a sunnah so this fast is referred to as a sunnah and the reason why it is ref it is said that this fast yeah, in the fasting of three days in a month is sunnah because the only fast in which the Muslim is obligated to fast is the fasting of the month of Ramadan the fasting of the month of Ramadan is the only fast that a Muslim is obligated to fast. And if a person doesn't fast the month of Ramadan, we say, He is deserving of punishment and torment from Allah. He is deserving of punishment and torment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why we say, Amarana, when Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu said, Amarana, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded us, we say that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his intent here was Amra istihbabin la amra ijab. That the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recommended us with this form of worship and he didn't obligate it upon us such that it is an obligation. Why is that the case? Because the only month that a Muslim is obligated to fast is the fast of Ramadan. And so we extrapolate a number of benefits from this hadith. The first, the legislating of fasting three days in every month. The legislating of fasting three days in every month. And this was taken from the hadith of Abi Dhar and the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiyallahu anh. The hadith of Abi Dhar is the hadith before us. يعني بين يدينا وبين أيدينا. As for the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiyallahu anh, then he radiallahu anhu said, Awsani Khalili sallallahu alayhi wa sallama bi thalath. And from that, Siyamu thalathati ayyamin min kulli shahar. Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu said, My friend, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, commanded me and admonished me and advised me with, th with three. And from that, he radiallahu anhu said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised him to fast three days in a month. And the most preferred of these days are the white days. Are the white days. And the white days are the days in which the moon is full and complete. And they are the 13th, the 14th, 
and the 15th, as it occurs in this hadith that we have before us, the hadith of Abi Dhar radiallahu an, whereby he said, Amarana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Nasuma min al-shahri thalathata ayyam, thalathata ashrata wa arba'a ashrata wa khamsa ashra. That Messenger Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded us to fast for three days of every month, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. However, whether a person fasts three days consecutively or three days in a month separately, يعني, they're all scattered all across a month. So for instance, in the first 10 days, he fasts one day, the middle 10 days, he fasts one day, and in the last 10 days, he fasts one day, then that is permissible and there is no blame upon him. However, that which is preferred is as Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu said that the Messenger of Allah told him to fast the 13th, 14th and 15th. Similarly, that which supports our statement that if a person fasts the f- or one day during the first 10 days and a second day during the second 10 days and fasts a third day on the last 10 days, there is no blame upon him. Is a hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha whereby she said, لم يكن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يبالي أصام أول الشهر أم أوسطه أم آخرة Aisha radiallahu anha said that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't mind whether he fasted at the beginning of the month or during the middle of the month or at the end of the month and so that is why we say it is not a condition that a Muslim fasts them consecutively and that's why we say if a person wishes to fast a day at the beginning of the month and then we, he wishes to fast another day during the second 10 days of the month and he wishes to fast a third day during the last 10 days of the month then there is no blame upon that person inshallah we move on to the 31st hadith قال رحمه الله تعالى وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يحل لمرأة أن تصوم وزوجها شاهد إلا بإذنه متفق عليه واللفظ للبخاري وزاد أبو داود غير رمضان أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه الله سبحانه وتعالى be pleased with him narrated that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said it isn't permitted for a woman to fast even for one day while her husband is present except with his permission. This hadith is found in Bukhari Muslim and that is why the author Rahimullah said Muttafaqun alayhi agreed upon and the wording is from Al-Bukhari. Abu Dawood's recording and his recorded wording of this hadith states unless it is during Ramadan meaning then she does not need his permission to fast. Here, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا يحل It isn't permitted It isn't permitted Meaning يحرم عليها It is impermissible, it is haram And what is the definition of haram? When we say this is haram When we say such and such thing is haram What does that mean? then the definition that some scholars say is that they say yuthabu tariku yuthabu tariku wa yu'aqabu fa'ilu they say whoever carries out that haram action whoever carries out that haram action naam they say that whoever leaves that haram action is rewarded and whoever carries out that haram action, then he is punished. And this definition is not precise. And that's why the scholars, they mention that the more precise and accurate ta'rif and definition of haram is that a person should say, يُثَابُ تَارِكُهُ إِمْتِثَالًا وَيَسْتَحِقُّ الْعِقَابُ فَاعِلُهُ وَيَسْتَحِقُّ الْعِقَابُ فَاعِلًا That a person says Whoever leaves off the haram attaining by way of that the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then he is rewarded 
And whoever carries that out, then he is deserving of punishment. We don't say he's going to be punished. We say he's deserving of punishment. And he qualifies for punishment. Does that mean he will be punished? No. Taht al Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him or either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives him, then that is from his sublime mercy. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes him, then that's from his sublime justice because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only punished him for something that he's gone and done. And the reason why we say the ta'rif and the definition of haram is more precise this way that we say yuthabu tarikuhu imtithala that if a person leaves off the haram attaining by way of that the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then and then only is he rewarded then this is taken actually from the Quran qala ta'ala la khayra fi kathirin min najwahum illa man amara bis sadaqatin aw ma'rufin aw islahin bayna an-nas wa man yaf'al dhalika ibtigha'a marratillah fasawfa tihi al-jannah al-'adhim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that there is no good in much of the low speech and the quarrels except for a person who commands with sadaqa or commands with good or hastens to rectify between the people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ ابْتِغَاءَ مَرَّاتِ اللَّهِ Whoever does that seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then we shall grant him a great reward. Because, ayyuhul ikhwatul akarim, a person might stay away from alcohol because alcohol smells, alcohol is not good for your kidney and your liver, and it's, you know, contrary to what uh, science uh, uh, legislates, and so therefore I'm going to stay away from alcohol. His staying away from alcohol, is it tadayyunan? Is it out of religious reason? No. And so he can't be compared to a person who leaves alcohol because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade it. They can't be compared. And so that's why whoever leaves of the haram, attaining by way of that the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is to be rewarded. And he is deserving of punishment, that person that carries out that sin. And here is an aqeedah point from the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they don't, لا يجزمون بالعقوبة. They don't place and indefinite the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon a Muslim because we say that that person is under the mashia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him and that will be out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sublime justice or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him and that is out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sublime mercy. And so the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لا يحل It isn't permitted. In essence that means يحرم It is impermissible. It is haram. So we extrapolate a number of benefits from this hadith. The first the impermissibility the first the impermissibility of the wife fasting a voluntary fast without the permission of her husband whilst he is present the impermissibility of the wife fasting a voluntary fast without the permission of her husband whilst her, he is present and this is the apparent of the hadith. This is the apparent of the hadith. With regards to the obligatory fast, then the ruling is clear. Then the ruling is clear. She has to fast it, so she does not need her husband's permission. However, with regards to the voluntary fast, then the Muslim wife isn't allowed Islamically to fast while her husband is present. And if she does so, she is sinful. If she fasts while her husband is present without seeking his permission to fast, then Islamically, she is sinful. And the reason why she's sinful is because the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, لا يحل, It is impermissible. And if I want something that's impermissible, then whoever does something that's impermissible, then they are sinful. And the reason why it's impermissible is because 
the rights of the husband in Islam are great. The rights of the husband in Islam are great. And the fact of the matter is, her husband might need her. Her husband might need her. And obeying and the obeying of her husband, then the reward that's at, that tied, is tied to that is that she will be asked to enter whichever of the doors of paradise she wishes to enter from. If a woman obeys her husband, then the reward tied to that is that she will be requested and asked to enter whichever of the doors of paradise she wishes. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا صلت المرأة خمسها وصامت شهرها وحفظت فرجها وأطاعت زوجها قيل لها أدخلي الجنة من أي من أي أبواب الجنة شئت. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that if the Muslim wife fasts or prays her five daily prayers and she fasts her month. And she preserves her private part. And she obeys her wife. It will be said to her, enter from, enter paradise from whichever of the doors of paradise, paradise you wish. And ayyuhu al-ikhwatu wal akhawat, and in particular al-akhawat, this shows us the importance in obeying the husband. So do not turn to those people that speak with the speech of the zanadiqah and the heretics and they say oh uh, misogynistic and controlling and min hadha al-kalam al-fariq this speech that has no substance to it this is deen this is sharia it's not my speech or the speech of any other philosopher or man that lived 100, 200, 300 years ago this is the statement of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is the statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And just as we encourage the men to emulate and be like the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in their interactions with their wives and in all their affairs that they carry out, similarly we encourage the women to emulate the wives of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha whereby she said she would have to make up fasts from the previous Ramadan and she wouldn't be able to do so except in the month of Sha'ban. Eleven entire months she wouldn't be able to make up for her fast. Why? She said, Due to the level of the Messenger of Allah, due to the station and the degree of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was her husband. And so she was serving her husband. So is it permissible for a Muslim woman to think in the year 2020 that obeying her husband is misogynistic or controlling? Then without a doubt this kind of speech and this kind of rhetoric is not uttered upon the tongue of a Muslim woman. MashaAllah, when, when it comes to serving the husband, misogynistic. When it comes to serving the husband, it's backwards. When it comes to serving the husband, it's uh, 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 taking people back into the medieval times. However, stripping women of their honor, making them naked, uh, telling them to do lewd things, that's civilization, that's hawara. Now you know why we're in a state that we're in. Mafahim have gone upside down. Well, the way people think have gone upside down. And that's why a poet, when he was asked to say something, one of the uh, uh, Ibad and the Zuhad, when he was asked to say something about the time we live in, he said, He said, this is the time in which we were warned about. In the statement of Ibn Ka'ib and the statement of Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Ka'ib, Ubay ibn Ka'ib radiallahu an. Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. Whereby the times that, we're gonna, that we live in, it, and that was, that's what the, that was in the time that he lived in, not 2020, not 1441. 
فنسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يهدي المسلمين آمين So this is the ruling If it's a voluntary fast She can't fast whilst her husband is present Except by his permission If it's an obligatory fast Then she can do so And so The Muslim woman She finds herself with regards to fasting In three different scenarios She finds herself with regards to fasting In three different scenarios The first That her husband prohibits her from fasting Whereby he says she or you aren't allowed to fast This is We're speaking about the voluntary fast now The voluntary fast With regards to the voluntary fast She finds herself in three different scenarios The first is that her husband says uh, Sarah, you can't fast He prohibits her from fasting Then Islamically, she isn't allowed to fast Islamically, she isn't allowed to fast And if she does fast She is sinful Due to the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it isn't permitted for a woman to fast Even for one day While her husband is present Except with his permission And here he hasn't given her permission to fast And so if she does fast She is sinful The second scenario a Muslim woman finds herself in Is that her husband allows her to fast He allows her to fast And so she is permitted Islamically to fast if he all of a sudden comes along and says, I need you, I want you, and all the rest of it, then it is impermissible for him to break her fast. It is impermissible for him to break her fast. And if he comes along and breaks her fast, then he is sinful. He is sinful. That's the second scenario. The first, he prohibits her. He says he can't fast. So she's not allowed to fast. If she fasts, she's sinful. The second is that he actually allows her. If he allows her, then she is permitted to fast and Islamically she's allowed to fast. However, it is impermissible for him to come along now and break her fast. The third scenario a Muslim woman might find herself in and a Muslim wife might find herself in is that her husband doesn't allow her, neither does he prohibit her. He doesn't vocally and verbally say you can fast, neither does he say you can't fast. Then what does she do? Then she can fast. However, if he needs her, he can break her fast. If he needs her, he can break her fast. And so here we've mentioned the three scenarios. The first is that a Muslim man prohibits his wife from fasting. She's not allowed to fast. And if she does fast, she's sinful. The second is the opposite, whereby he allows her to fast. His wife, he allows his wife to fast. And she is allowed to fast. And it is impermissible for him to break her fast. And the moment he breaks her fast, he's sinful. And the third, that is that, third scenario is that he doesn't allow her, neither does he prohibit her. In which case we say that you're allowed to fast. However, if your husband needs you, he can break your fast. And with regards to the third one, then it's down to the discretion of the married couple. Uh, you communicate with one another However you communicate with one another And you come to a common ground And common solution Because The key to a happy and successful marriage Is communication We have come to the end of our session For today We shall continue tomorrow Insha'Allah وهذا آخر الباني على هذا المجلس سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك أتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته